Thank you so much for joining us for this Thursday Pastors Bible Study. My name is Pastor Jack Horner, and I'm going to be leading us as we talk about uh, the third chapter of Galatians. This third chapter of Galatians is really, really important, especially if you want to better understand uh, Lutheran theology. It's one of the chapters that uh, Saint Paul, uh, that that Martin Luther, particularly addressed and looked at. Um, especially as it relates to the, our understanding as Lutherans of what is justification uh, by faith through grace. Um, it begins this way, you foolish Galatians. He's starting out, you know, to make everybody feel nice, right? In the first chapter, it was brothers and sisters. And now in uh, this third chapter, he begins, you foolish Galatians. He's going to get serious with them. He wants them to understand that <clears throat> that the, the theology that they have been pursuing, that had been given to them by the Judaizers, that it's, it's a real problem. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of what the gospel is at its very core. And he's not going to mince words in showing them his displeasure over their following out and following after this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly ex exhibited as crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, you are now ending with the flesh. Did you experience so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Well then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law, or by your believing what you heard? Now, most of chapter 1 and 2, Paul was defending the origin of his message, of his apostolic message, that he had been uh, uh, touched by God to deliver the gospel to the Gentiles. And he wants to make sure that they understand that he is a, a teacher in standing, if you will. He's just not somebody that, that showed up, you know, because they just felt like it. No, he has been um, specifically touched by God, addressed by God to be an apostle, a witness of the gospel to, um, to the Gentiles. His insights that he has has been derived from God, independent of anybody else. And now he's going to get serious with the Galatians. He repeats twice this word foolish, both uh, in, the first, in the first verse as well as in the third verse. That shows us the sharpness of his message that's going to follow. It is aggressive in tone. You just don't go around calling somebody foolish, right? And yet it's more than just a reprimand. Paul wants to express to them his deep concern and quite frankly also his questioning of why in the heck would they follow after these people? and follow after this theology that they're uh, professing, that you have to be circumcised in order to be a true believer. The word bewitched that he used here has the sense of deluded or perverted. And what he's saying to them is, you need to think. Think about how did you become a believer? to think about the things that are important to you. And how does that relate to the, the Judaizers' uh, insistence that you have to be circumcised before you can actually be a real believer? And the way he does that is by saying what their position is saying contradicts what you have experienced, what you have seen, specifically that Jesus has been crucified and his crucifixion means something as it relates 
to the law or the Torah of God. He says in 1 Corinthians verse chapter 2, verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What he's saying here is that on the cross, Jesus did everything to reconcile humankind to God. That there is nothing that needs to be added to that reconciliation. Christ has accomplished all of it by his death on the cross. Christ's work is done. Sinners may be justified before God and by God, not because of anything that they do, any work that they accomplish on their own. It is done by the atoning work of Christ on the cross. When he died, he died once and for all. It's a done deal. The gospel is not just good advice for human beings. Like, hey, do this, it's a nice way to live. It's not just about that. It's an invitation to us to engage in a life in Christ. It's a declaration of what God has done for all of humanity. It's not a demand. It's an offer, an invitation placed before you and for me. <clears throat> I love that imagery because when I look at a cross, when I look at a cross, whether it's a, a plain cross or a cross with the, the broken body of Jesus or, or Jesus resurrected like we have in our nave, when I, when I look at that, it just reminds me of that invitation. You know, the, the, the axis of the, it looks like open arms and even cr Jesus on the cross, it's, it's open arms, right? It's not a scolding finger. It's open arms welcoming us, inviting us into that relationship with him. Paul goes on to talk about this, the spirit that Christian life begins by hearing and believing, not by doing, right? You hear the story, and you're intrigued by it, and you believe it, and you want to follow, right? It doesn't start by you, you know, acting the right way, by you doing what you're supposed to do, by you following Torah, by you following the law, right? You hear the story, and you say, I want to know this Jesus. And there you learn how to live a Christ-like life. It is the Spirit at work in us that begins this journey and faith. Your faith, my faith, all starts with God's Holy Spirit. Now this is important because what Paul is setting up in chapter 3 here is what is commonly known in Lutheran circles as the proper distinction between law and gospel. Right? The law has a function. The law has something that it does. And the gospel also has a function and something that it does. And it's important for us as Christians to understand that distinction between what is the law and its function and what is the gospel and its function. The difference between them is this. The law says, do this, right? The gospel says, Christ has done it all. The law requires works of human achievement, right? It takes work to follow the law. If you've ever read Leviticus or Deuteronomy, I mean, geez, I mean, you got to line all this. I mean, there's proper ways of, of doing food. There's proper ways of cleanliness. There's proper ways of, you know, all sorts of things, you know, that you have to do to follow the law. The gospel requires faith in Christ's achievement. In other words, looking to Christ on the cross and believing. The law makes demands and tells us you must obey. The gospel brings promises and invites us to enter into that relationship with Christ. So in that way, the gospel and the law are contradictory to one another. 
They are not two aspects of the same thing or even interpretations of, of the same Christianity. Luther says the establishing of the law is the abolishing of the gospel. Let's continue on. Just as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Now, Paul bringing up Abraham is actually a, great, a really, really, really smart. You know, Paul is a, a Pharisee. Uh, as, you, as, we stu- as we learned two weeks ago, he studied under uh, Gamaliel. Um, smart, smart guy, okay? For the Judaizers, if they're going to look back at, at, at who is their hero, right, it would be Moses, Right? Moses is the one who came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, established the law, um, you know, gave the law. And matter of fact, even there are some that say that, that the, uh, there were angels that gave Moses the Ten Commandments and the law. Right? And that was a popular belief back in those, in those days, and you're going to see that a little bit later. Um, so what does Paul do? Paul decides, well, tell you what, I'm going to go 400 years earlier. And I'm going to talk about Abraham instead, right? Abraham, you know the story of Abraham. Abraham was old, he was childless, but God promised him a son, told him the, this great story, and you can just imagine, you know, since I was just in the desert, you know, you know, took him out, said, look up, what do you see? And if you've ever been in a remote place, where there's no, none, of our, none of our fluorescent lights are going or anything like that, and you look up, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Have you been able to ever do that in your life? Go, drive to a corner of Pennsylvania, you know, up in the mountains, and just and do that. Everybody has to do that. Uh, you look up and you go, oh, that's the Milky Way. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things, you know. Oh, that's, oh, okay. I saw pictures in a book, but <laughs> there it is. Oh, look, you know. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, the, the, the sky is just filled, filled with stars, bright stars, other stars. It's amazing how much we miss because of the ambient light that is, that is going on from houses and, and streets and everything else. But he's told to look up in the sky and count the stars, and he said, this is what your descendants are going to be like. Now imagine what that must have been like for, for somebody who is old like that who always wanted to have a child, right? I mean, that's how you pass on your, your, your life. I mean, that's how they thought. You, you passed on your life through your children. How do, you, how do you pass on what you have accomplished all of those years if you, don't have any, if you don't have any progeny, you don't have any children to be able to pass it on to? So it was an amazing promise to him, right? There's a great scene where He's, re, he's, he's told of this promise again. His wife over here, who is also elderly, and her response is probably the most, one of the most human responses in all of Scripture. She laughs, right? Sure, right. Okay, gotcha. But Abraham believed. He believed in the promise and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, it was reckoned to him that he was in a right relationship with God because he believed in this promise. God makes promises. And Abraham believes. And Abraham is accepted by God, accepted as right by faith. The blessing is justification. He is, he is made right. He's justified before God. And it's the greatest of all blessings. The verbs that are used here to justify and to bless are used as equivalents in verse 8. 
And the means by which the blessing would be inherited is by faith. What does that mean? You're not born into it. You don't inherit it. You don't deserve it. It is given to you by faith. The Judaizers were telling the Galatian converts that they should become the sons of Abraham by circumcision. Right? That, that whatever, wherever they were in their spiritual state just wasn't quite good enough. Right? It wasn't enough to accept that, that, that faith, to accept that belief. They now needed to do something to show that they really believed. And that is what Paul is objecting to. What he is saying is that the Galatians were already sons of Abraham. They were already part of the family of God. Not by circumcision, but by faith. So think of it as, uh, if, it's, uh, if we're going to turn it into a formula, it's very, very simple. It's like this. I wish I had a board here. The gospel equals the cross. If you want to know what's, what's, the, what's the foundation of the gospel, the gospel is the cross. Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of the world. Period. That's what the gospel is. The cross gives blessing. When we look at a cross, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we look on that not only with sadness at the death of the Messiah, but also we look at it as blessing. That it is from that that God has reconciled the world. From that action, God has reconciled the world to himself. And it stands before us as a blessing. When we look at a cross, it should make you feel, it should make your heart feel glad or good. Because this is how, this is how God has chosen to, to, to bring the whole world to himself. So the cross gives blessing. And then finally, the blessing requires nothing. Nothing from you or from me. To be a free gift, it has to be free, right? If somebody gives you a gift and said, oh, I have a wonderful present for you, I have a wonderful gift for you, and here, but before I give it to you, it would be really nice if you give me something in return, right? You would look at that and go, well, that's not a free gift, is it? It's like, you know, when you, get that, when you get that thing in the mail and says, you know, come for a free three-day vacation in a resort, right? It's free. It's on the house. All we want you to do is just come to this meeting, <laughs> right, where we try to sell you a condo. It's not really free. If you've got to sit through a, an hour presentation about why you should buy a condo, it's not a free it's not really free. It's going to cost you something, if not just aggravation, right, and pressure or whatever. It is free. Okay. Let's continue on here. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
This is really, really good stuff. I mean, really, this is really good, good stuff. Especially when, if, when you're a Lutheran. <laughs> that have grown up, you know, hearing sermons about justification. I mean, this is just like, man, this is like, we're playing baseball, right? This is like right, right there on the bat, you know? You're about to swing. I, I don't, that's probably, you know, for some people a bad analogy. But boy, when you hit that ball and you hit it right and just, it just feels great right? Or if you're playing golf, right? The sweet spot, you know? That shot that you have that says, oh man, I could, I could be a professional, you know? <clears throat> I get those at least once every round that I play. Every round. I have one shot that's like, man, I could have been playing with Tiger Woods, you know? Yeah. Of course, what makes those guys is they can do four days of that. Every shot. Yeah, I can't do that. I got one. I can even do one. All right, what is this about? The righteousness shall live by faith. It is all about relationship. It's all about a right relationship. What does right mean? A right means that you are blessed, that you are accepted. Cursed, what does cursed mean? Condemned. Doomed. And why? Because we can never fully complete the law. Human beings are sinners. This is not something where, now when we talk about human beings sinners, this is not something like, gee, occasionally we make mistakes. No. This is sinners right at our core. It's what we are. You know, we look at those Ten Commandments, and I I would invite you, uh, like on a Sunday, if um, if you're here Uh, You open up the hymnal. I think it's in the back. I think it's in the back of the hymnal, maybe. Maybe not. Is it in the back, the the, uh, catechism? Or or go online. Look at Luther's small catechism. Read his explanation of the Ten Commandments. It's really fascinating because when you read Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments, you realize, oh, this is hard. This is hard stuff. For example, when Luther is talking about you shall not kill, Luther says, you know, so what does this mean, you shall not kill? He says, well, you shall not kill, but you should also do not harm, but you should also actually do everything that you can to help your neighbor. That's what it means to fulfill the commandment, you shall not kill kill. Well, talk about a broad definition. Dolphin definition. I mean, we look at these commandments and how, even the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. And we think, oh, that's easy. I'm going to believe in Jesus. By the way, let me check out my 401k. Because in Vanguard, I trust. Right? So we create these, these gods for ourselves. And uh, Paul Tillich, who was a theologian in the 1950s, we called that the, your ultimate concern. What is that thing that you are just... It's your ulti- you're, you're Ultimately, you're, this is what you're concerned about, whatever it is. We all have these through our lives. They're different. You know, when you were a teenager, your ultimate concern was probably your friends, right? God forbid something happened and, and your friends turned on you. I mean, that would have just been the awful. There are probably more suicides that happen with teenagers because the God of friendship evaporates and they just don't know what to do about it. And especially this, in this day of social media where kids can just be vicious, adults can be vicious, right? It's a, the, can, the cancel culture is not, this is not new. This has been around for a long, long time. You know, with people just, rejecting people out of hand for, 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 for whatever reason, you know. That's been going on for quite some time. And, it, and, it's, and it's something that, that, can, that can rise to the level of, de- of deity for us. So what, what Paul is saying is here is... <clears throat> This is a no-win situation as it relates to the law. No one can perfectly obey the law. No one can perfectly observe the law. 
of everything that is in the book of the law. And the law demands perfection. Right? Do it. But that is an impossibility for sinful human beings. So what Paul's saying is the law cannot save. Period. Period. We are saved through Christ. Through his actions on the cross. Now verse 11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law for the one who is righteous lives by faith has been interpreted in two different ways all the way back to the first century. Right? All the way back to the first century. There's, there's two different ways that that has been looked at. One is the righteous will live by faith in God or the righteous will live by God's faithfulness. Now, in either dimension in either way we need to depend on God for our justification which I think is the main point the concept of justification and and this concept that we need to live by faith in God you know this is not just oh in the New Testament everything changed and we we all got this we all understood this you can find justification by faith in the Old Testament as well okay that's really important because I don't want to set, I don't want to create this distinction between there is the Old Testament, ooh, bad law, and how can we even do it, and New Testament, everything's good, right? Now you don't have to do anything, right? That's too easy of a distinction. You are going to find law and gospel in both Old Testament and New Testament. Let me say that again. You can find both law, the demands, and gospel, the freedom, in both Old Testament as well as New Testament. Okay? So it just didn't, it just didn't happen. You're going you're gonna to find, gra- find grace in the Old Testament. Right? And, and you know that because there are times where a pastor will, will preach on the Old Testament and you know, you'll see, oh wow, there's, you know, what, a, what a beautiful story that is. And, and look at how it really touches us and helps us in our Christian faith, right? You know, it's, it's not just about demands, you know, this, this, I think people have this, this wrong perception of, oh, the God of the Old Testament is, is vindictive, right? Well, God in the Old Testament can seem vindictive for sure, but there's also grace. I mean, let's go back to Abraham. You know, you're well past childbearing years. You've always wanted a child. You know what? I'm going to give you a child. What's vindictive about that? It's pure grace. It's a pure, a pure act of love, right? Of acceptance, of righteousness, right? And his faith is accorded to him as righteousness. This is a, it's a beautiful story of justification by, by faith, right? Being made right by faith and by his response of, 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 of believing. Faith has value only if the object of its faith is true and dependable. Faith has value only if the object of the faith is true and dependable. We can have faith in God because he is true and dependable. You can have all sorts of faith in all sorts of things. People do all the time. They can have faith in a spouse. What happens when the spouse, spouse cheats on them? Right? Wasn't, wasn't very good, was it? didn't work out. The object of our faith, when our, the object of our faith is God, we will find life. If our object of faith is something other than God, ultimately, both the God as well as us will fall. We will fail. The faith by which the righteous lives has a very definitive object. He is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. 
period. And that, God, we can be sure in. We can trust. Leviticus 18 says, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. So he's quoting, uh, he's po- quoting something from um, uh, Leviticus here in um, verse 5. I'm sorry, it was Leviticus 18, 5. But it was, yeah, 12 and 13, verse 12, verse 12. The law itself says that only perfect performance of the law can gain approval from God. One can only live by the law by doing the works of the law. As we said, the problem is nobody can really do that. It's humanly impossible. He then talks about Christ has become a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Quotation meant not that a person was cursed by God because he was hanged. Rather, to be hanged on a tree signified to the Jews that that person had been cursed. So Christ was not cursed because he was crucified. Rather, he willingly allowed himself to become cursed for all humanity. And thus he endured the cross, his own crucifixion, at the hands of uh, the Romans. All right, any questions there? Let's let's go on. Verse 15, brothers and sisters, I give an example from daily life. Once a person's will has been ratified, no one adds to it or annuls it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings as of many, but it says, and to your offspring, that is, to the one person who is Christ. My point is this. The law which came 430 years later does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it no longer comes from the promise. But God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring would come to whom the promise had been made. It was ordained through angels by a mediator. Now a mediator involves more than one party, but God is one. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could make alive, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture has imprisoned all things under the power of sin, so that what was promised through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Notice the the change in language, right? He went from brothers and sisters to you foolish Galatians, now he's back to brothers and sisters, right? So he has, he has um, tackled the Judaizers' argument head on, showed them how they were, uh, he, he has theologically shown them where they are wrong and how they are approaching the law and the gospel. And now he goes back to more... Um, um, what's the word? More familiar terms, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, nicer terms. Uh, I'm looking for a, a better word there, but you know, he now goes for more endearing, endearing 
terms, I guess, rather than calling them fools. Uh, now he calls them brothers and sisters. And <clears throat> he is going to anticipate. Now, he does, th- and he does this in other places, by the way, in other, in other of his writings. He will anticipate and throw out questions that he expects other people to throw out in argument against what he's trying to do, right? So in this case, he's going to, he's going to, um, he's going to answer what he thinks are going to be the questions. That's a good debate tactic, right? Let me explain something. We're in a pol- political situation right now, right? Where the primary is coming. You, you see that when they're in debates. I better answer, like, like say, say I've done something that is, I'm a politician, like say for example, I've done something that is a little suspect or I know I'm getting heat for it, right, from somebody else. The thing to do is not to avoid it, right? Let me talk about it first so I can kind of explain why I did whatever I did or where I'm coming from, whatever it was. Maybe it was a, a certain vote or, or, or something in my history or whatever it is, right? I want, I want to have the opportunity to explain myself before somebody else tries to explain it for me. That's what Paul's trying to do here. He's anticipating the question that, that they might bring up, and now he's going to answer them. So the Judaizers, they might, they might agree to a certain extent with Paul that Abraham was justified by his faith. I mean, it's in Scripture after all. That's what it says. But then they would add that the coming of the law changed the basis for this gaining of salvation. In other words, when God gave the law, he changed his mind that he has reckoned to him by faith. He's he's added something to that promise. So Paul decides to use the image or the metaphor of a, a contract. In this case, it's a divine contract. And what he's saying is that when God does a contract, when, he, when promises are made, these promises that God makes are eternal. These are eternal promises. The promises don't change. Now, as I was doing this research, it was really kind of interesting um, because evidently there were different ways in which Jews, Greeks, and Romans understood legal contracts, right? So on one level, we need to understand who's he... Wh- which kind of contract is he talking about? Is he talking about a Jewish contract? Is he talking about a Roman contract? Is he talking about a Greek contract? Because you would understand that a little bit differently depending on how they do that. And this is, what I, this is what I learned, and I think this is kind of interesting, kind of cool. Keep in mind, Galatia is in what is modern-day Turkey, but would have a much more Greek influence than it would a Roman influence. The Greeks, you know, Alexander the Great got there before everybody else, a couple hundred years before, right? So in the Greek world, once a will was registered at the records office, not even the originator could change it or reverse the basic intent. It was irrevocable. Interesting, right? So once you put a contract up and you said, this is what I want, say it's your will, that's probably the contract that most people right, engage in, right? Their, their own will. When you did that, it was done. You can't change the intent. You can't go in there and go, you know what? I, don't want, I want to take that last child out of my will. You can't do it. It's done. This is probably the one that that Paul has in mind here, because certainly what he is saying is that God's contract, God's promises are irrevocable. God didn't revoke Abraham's promise that he was made right by faith because now he he has offered the law. The Jews certainly enjoyed many privileges and responsibilities as a part of the Abrahamic covenant. But blessing the nations was the Messiah's role. Right? The Messiah, and they understood this, the Messiah was going to be a blessing to the world, not just to Jews. And it is this promise 
that is everlasting. It is this promise that Jesus fulfilled by his death on the cross. God gave the promise to Abraham because he loved Abraham. And he didn't reject him. He didn't, he didn't take it away. And he didn't give him the promise because he deserved it. And we don't receive the promise from Christ because we deserve it. So Paul makes four distinct observations about the law. Or he made it before uh, during, during this whole chapter. First, the law could not give the Holy Spirit. You don't receive the Holy Spirit because of your observance of the law. The law cannot give righteousness. The law cannot make you right with God. The law cannot justify. If, only, if anything, it condemns, right? Because you can't fulfill all of it. And the law cannot change the fact that righteousness always comes by faith in God's promises. So, when Lutherans are talking about this, we talk about three uses of the law. The first is, a, is that of, a, these are kind of, also has metaphors attached to them. The first is curb, a curb. So that would be more of a negative you, image or be perceived as negative, right? The law keeps the sinful nature of both Christians and non-Christians under check. How? By fear. By the idea that we will be punished if we do something wrong, right? So that's a negative, that's a negative reinforcement, if you will, right? Don't rob the store, because if you rob the store, you're going to go to jail for eight years or whatever, whatever it is, right? Don't steal. Do not steal. If you steal, you're going to go to jail, right? So it's, supposed to, it's a negative thing. Another use of the law is that of a mirror. Now, this one is more neutral. What happens when you have a mirror and you look in a mirror? What do you see? If you look into a mirror, what do you see? Yourself right? Yourself. You get to see yourself. And by doing so, you realize, oh my gosh, I don't like what I'm looking at, <laughs> right? And it, and it shows you who you are. I, I think a lot of our confessions that we do in church on a Sunday are meant to be like mirrors, right? Recognize that you are in bondage to sin and cannot free yourself. Gosh, you know, I keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. I come on Sunday, and God, you know, confession happens, and I go, oh, gosh, you know, please make me not snap at, uh, you know, my spouse. I do it all the time, right? And it shows that uh, I'm in bondage, and I just, I, I just can't seem to break out of that, right? You know, repeating sins over and over again, right? Um, I think it's interesting that I think more, more than one people that have been addicted, right, whether it's to alcohol or to drugs, you know, they have those moments, you know, where they look in a mirror, really look in a mirror. Have you heard those stories? Where they, where they actually look in a mirror and they go, who am I? I don't, they don't even recognize themselves, especially with drugs that are, you know, uh, like a heroin that would really make you emaciated. Um, what is it, crystal meth? It really messes up your faith, your face and your teeth and all that stuff. I mean, you can literally see what it's doing to the person, right? It's destroying them. And they can, but, but for the first time, they get a realization that, oh my God, look at what's happening here. All right, it's a mirror. And then a positive one is that it can also be a guide. Now, this applies uh, to Christians that the law can help us do the right thing. And the law can help us be a, a helper, a believer, you know. Can, it can guide us in life, right? We can understand, you know, go back to Paul's explanation about you shall not kill, okay? It's not just, it doesn't mean just murder. It means, wow, I should really be, I, I should be good toward my neighbor, right? I should try to help my neighbor in whatever they need, right? It has that positive influence on how we live out our lives. Okay. 
Paul does another thing. <clears throat> Paul then continues to do this. Why then the law, right? So he's, he's throwing out these questions and he's answering it. He does this in a lot of letters. He's going to throw out a question. It's not that he doesn't know, <laughs> right? He wants to answer it. He wants to throw out, it. okay, the Judaizers, after, after I just said, you know, talked about the law, the Judaizers are going to go, well, well, then why the law? Why do we even have it, right? Oh, let me answer that for you, right? Uh, and there, that was that thing that I told you about, that the law had been given to Moses by angels, and he kind of addresses that. This is what a British Baptist pastor at the turn of the century said. The Mosaic law was not designed to be the final code of the religious life, but to prepare the soil of the heart to receive Jesus Christ in all the fullness of salvation. Now think about that. So the role of the law is to help prepare the heart. You know, if you see that here are the, these laws, I cannot fulfill them. I'm still not living the kind of life that God intends. Oh my gosh, what do I do? For Luther, he looked at his small catechism and said, okay, first I'm going to teach you about the Ten Commandments. And what you're going to realize when you study the Ten Commandments is you can't keep them. You personally cannot put yourself in a right relationship with God. And by virtue of not being in a right relationship of God, what does that mean? You are doomed. Right? You're doomed. Then the next question you would ask yourself is, oh my gosh, if I am doomed, to whom shall I turn? <laughs> to whom shall I go? And then he teaches about the Apostles' Creed. Here's who you turn to, right? The God who created everything. Jesus, who lived, died, and rose again. The Spirit, which gives you life and gives life to the church. That's to whom you turn. Now, the Judaizers might have concluded that Paul, when he was talking about the law, was that the law was evil, as I said before. Here, here he's very, being very, very um, straightforward and saying, no, absolutely not. Both the promises and the law were given by God. Both are important, but for different reasons. And it's important to understand, here it comes again, the proper distinction between law and gospel. Sin affects humanity without discrimination. The whole world is permeated by sin, making each person a prisoner of sin. I think that's it. I think that's what I want to talk about. Any questions? Oh, by the way, that word disciplinarian, the Greek word is paidogogos, which is kind of difficult to translate into English. It's really an educational term. We get the, we get the word pedagogy from that word. So it has, a, it has the connotation of being a tutor or instructor, Right? is kind of derived from it. So it sounds rough in the English disciplinarian, but think of a disciplinary in like old school, you know, it's like a teacher, like a teacher or tutor. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this Thursday morning Bible study. We're so glad that you're with us today. Join us next week when we're going to be looking at chapter four. Take care and God bless your week.